It's an extremely important topic, and how we respond to the people that have served our country is obviously a, a very, very important issue for all of us. Um, to first do an official welcome, we have Representative Dave Lopesack here. Representative Lopesack uh, was just uh, reelected for his fifth term in Congress. He's a member of the House Armed Services Committee and the House Education and Workforce Committee. And many of you know, he's been very interested and active in veterans' issues and issues related to the military and like to do the official welcome from him. So All right. Thank you, thank you Peter. Um, it is wonderful to be here today. I'm very impressed that you would invite me to do the official welcome. Um, since I'm not a veteran, uh, although I'm on the Armed Services Committee and I've been to Iraq a few times and to Afghanistan a half a dozen times. Um, and I had a couple of uh, Veterans Day events today. Earlier I was in Muscatine for an event and rocketed over here from the Rock Island Arsenal. We were out at the cemetery and since it's so chilly outside, we all kept our remarks blessedly brief. Uh, so we didn't have to be outside quite so much, but um, it's great to be here. I'm just going to say a couple of words, uh, and then soon enough I'll retreat to the back row where I think I need to be so I can listen to the experts and folks on the panel. But, um, you know, clearly veterans' affairs issues with respect to health care um, couldn't be more important. It's really unfortunate that it took the scandal in Phoenix to bring to light the concerns that some folks have expressed for a long time. We're very fortunate here in Iowa. Uh, the facility that we have in Des Moines, the VA medical hospital here in Iowa City, the com various community-based outpatient clinics that we have around Iowa, Cedar Rapids, Ottumwa, Decora, those are, and Bettendorf, those are pretty darn good facilities. We have issues with health care there. There's no question about that. Inevitably, that's going to be the case. But relatively speaking, the health care that our veterans get in Iowa is pretty darn good. Does it mean it can't be better? Of course it doesn't mean that. It can be better. And as your congressman, I invite you to make sure that you're in touch with my office. If you ever have any issues, Virginia is sitting in the back with the brown sweater. And uh, she's our case person on this. And, and Dave Lesh, of course, does work on this as well. Be in touch with us if you have any concerns, any issues. A lot of folks don't know that uh, one of the big jobs of a congressperson is to make sure that, you know, the federal government, whether it's a Social Security agency or whether it's uh, the VA, whatever, that make sure the federal government's doing what it's supposed to do for folks. And so that's a big part of what we do as members of Congress. Let us know if there are any issues. I'll just say one last thing. At a time when there's virtually no cooperation in Washington, D.C. between the parties, and especially the leaders in the parties, Veterans Affairs, since I've been, office, been in office, since January of 2007, Veterans Affairs has been kind of a shining example of what we actually can do if we put down our political partisan arms and work together, work across the aisle. And we've done that on a variety of fronts when it comes to the VA. Can we do better? Of course we can do better. But when, when the scandal broke in Phoenix, on the House side, Jeff Miller, who was the chair of the committee, and Mike Mishu, who's the outgoing ranking member, highest ranking Democrat, they put their heads together and they worked on things. And, and Jeff, I know Jeff very well. I'm not on the VA committee, but I'm on Armed Services. And I'll do what I can to work with the other side of the aisle so we can do the right thing for our veterans, not just on Veterans Day, not just on Memorial Day, but every day of the year. That's the least that I think I can do as a member of Congress. And I thank all the veterans who are here. I thank all the families of veterans who are here today. And I thank you every day of the year because if it weren't for you folks, there wouldn't be a Congress. I wouldn't be a congressman. And we wouldn't have the democracy that we have today. So thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. It's going to be a great, a great event. Thank you. be able to put on an event like this without other co-sponsors and people working with us. We have the Iowa City VA Healthcare System, the University of Iowa Center for Diversity and Enrichment, Military and Veteran Student Services, the University of Iowa Army ROTC and Air Force ROTC, the University of Iowa College of Dentistry, and Hancher Auditorium. So some might think, why Hancher Auditorium? <laughs> so to tell us why, we have Chuck Swanson, who is director of Hancher, and who is looking so forward to the new building post-flood. Right. We are. <laughs> but to do a welcome as well. Thank, Thank you, Pete. I really appreciate it. I, 
I want to add a warm welcome to uh, uh, Pete's welcome and to Representative Loebsack's welcome. And this is a topic that I just can't wait to hear the discussion from the panel because it's a topic that is really near and dear to everybody's heart. Um, I want to thank Pete and I want to thank Leslie Gannon for all their work in putting this together. And I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate Pete because I just heard today that he received the Educator of the Year Award from the College of Dentistry. Oh, and that, yes. that's quite an honor. So, congratulations. So, as Pete said, you know, why put Hancher into this illustrious group of, of people? And Hancher does a lot of work across campus, and this is part of a larger project that culminates this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday with performances called Healing War. This uh, is a creation from Liz Lerman. The performances will be in Space Place over at North Hall. You, tickets are still available at the Hancher box office. But Liz has created this piece that really reflects on the history of the Civil War and brings the, the themes of the Civil War to our current wars and really talks about healing. There's a lot about Clara Barton. There's a lot about healing with nurses, with, with the medical area, and how things went wartime, how the medical area really responds quickly. And I want to say that um, we have really enjoyed working with Ellen Roberts across campus. We, we love working with the veterans on campus. Uh, Alan has so much passion and he talks so much about the veterans that are students here on campus. Liz was here a couple weeks ago and we actually met with a lot of the students who are veterans and she really probed the questions and it was so interesting to hear from veterans to even hear about when there's a fireworks display and what reaction veterans have. That was a real education for me. So another piece of this project, after this discussion today, there's going to be a pop-up museum. This is in the commons area of the library, right here on the university campus. And this was put together by two of our staff members, Jacob Yarrow and Aaron Donahue. They work very closely with Britton Thomas from the commons area here at the library. And I would encourage all of you to stop by, because these are exhibits by students where they really have explored and done their research about the Civil War and about you know, medical help during wartime. And it will just take you a few minutes. So if you really have time, pop-up museum, it was a little bit of a struggle for everybody to understand this, but this has come together in such a glorious way. So once again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Leslie. And thank you to our illustrious panel. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And so now for our keynote address, and we do have a, a change in the schedule. I, I will say unfortunately, but very quickly unfortunately, our keynote speaker had to cancel out uh, just a couple of days ago. But in his stead, and who will do a fantastic job, is Dr. Peter Caboli. And Peter is the Chief of Medicine at the Iowa City VA Healthcare System and professor in the Department of Internal Medicine uh, at the College of Medicine here at, at the University of Iowa. He earned his BS in Biology and MS in Epidemiology and his MD degree all from the University of Iowa. And Peter and I have collaborated on research over the years in one of his previous lives as a health services researcher. And he's recently taken over as a director of medicine at the VA. And I know he has a passion for what goes on there and, and trying to improve the services that are provided with that. So with that, Dr. Kaboli. I probably do, don't I? Thank you. So I am the stand-in, uh, Dr. Randy Petzel, who used to be our network director here for many years and then became the uh, undersecretary uh, for uh, health at the VA. Uh, he resigned uh, in the wake of the scandal in, uh, in Phoenix. And I talked to him a few, week, or a few months, months ago when we planned this and uh, asked him if he would be willing to come and speak to us on this day. And he said he'd be happy to. And we thought this would be great. Somebody that had been in the, his entire career in the VA and then just a few days ago sent me a very polite email saying something's come up. So I'm the stand-in, so I will try to do my best. 
Um, I want to say that I, I actually grew up in Iowa. I'm not a veteran, but I grew up down in Donaldson, Iowa, down in Lee County. I went to undergraduate here uh, and medical school here. And part of the, actually the reason I didn't go in, I was going to go in the Air Force. I, I uh, got a scholarship to go to the Air Force and ultimately go to medical school in the Air Force. And then um, in the spring of when I graduated from high school, I got a scholarship from the American Legion. And the American Legion paid my entire undergraduate tuition at the University of Iowa. So I'm indebted to the American Legion for keeping me out of the Air Force, actually. So, um, so I, but I, this is my way a little bit of paying back. So a quick disclaimer, I have no financial conflicts of interest and the views expressed in this presentation are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Veterans Affairs. So I am, uh, I do work for the VA and it's interesting when I came back here in 1998, uh, I had done my medical school here but I trained out in Utah and when I came back, when I was trying to figure out where I was going to do my clinical work, uh, when I was doing research, I said to my boss at the time, I said, I'll work in any of the clinics in the hospital, but just don't send me to the VA. And that was my impression from when I was a medical student that that was not a place that I wanted to work. There were things about the VA that I absolutely did not like as a medical student. And I did some work at the, at the VA in Salt Lake City, and I, I liked the Salt Lake City VA. But then when I came back, I said, no, I don't want to work at the VA. And then I s gradually started spending more time in the VA. And there were things about it that had dramatically changed. Uh, you know, from the early 90s to the late 90s, and since then I think continually have changed. So I'm a huge supporter of the VA, so um, I'm sure there will be people here that might not agree with me, but that's why we have the panel discussion. So I'm going to talk about three things in about 20 minutes. I'm going to talk about what is an ideal healthcare system, and then I'm going to talk about how the VA achieves that, or many, in some ways doesn't achieve that. And then I want to talk about a few of my, at least my predictions for the future. You know, none of us uh, can predict the future. Uh, Yogi Berra said predictions are always difficult, especially ones about the future. So I'm going to do my best to at least make a few predictions. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on VA because I think there's a lot of misunderstandings a lot of times that people have about uh, how VA is structured. So VA actually has three, the Department of Veterans Affairs has three branches. The Cemetery Administration, which I don't have to work in. Uh, the Veterans Benefits Administration, which is what gets in the press a lot. And that's for delays in benefits or you hear people about having, uh, making claims. And that goes through VBA, not VHA. And so we have to keep those a little bit separate. And I have a picture to help you remember the difference. Um, so I work for VHA, the Veterans Health Administration. and. The whole VHA has about a thousand clinics, so the ones that we have affiliated with our medical center here are in Bettendorf, Decorah, Dubuque, Waterloo, Cedar Rapids, Ottumwa, and over in Quincy and Galesburg in Illinois, and in Sterling, Illinois. Uh, so we have about a thousand clinics, about 150 hospitals, 300 vet centers, 135 community living centers, and about 100 residential rehab treatment programs. So it's a pretty big organization, and that's why there's a $56 billion budget for it. So this is the, the one cemetery that's still taking veterans in, in Iowa. Does anybody know where this is? Keokuk. Keokuk, yeah. This is a Keokuk. I grew up in Lee County, so I, I've been to this cemetery before. Um, this is what has been, this is a picture from the internet about VBA and benefits and the issues of delays and waits and, and getting things processed. Um, one of the interesting things, because I know people who work and do processing for some of this is, uh, and review claims, one of the great solutions people have said is, well, why don't we just digitize all these records and make them all on the computer? Well, the problem with that is it's hard to look through a thousand PDFs. If you've ever clicked through a thousand PDFs of a record, it's really hard. But if you get a paper file in front of you, you can actually look through a paper file pretty quickly. And so it's interesting that people don't work with this, think they've got the solution, which is usually the case. And then here's a picture of the Iowa City VA where I, I, I get to work every day. So a quick review of the numbers, because I think this is, again, another misunderstanding that a lot of people have about veterans. So there's about just under 22 million veterans in this country. So it's about less than 7% of the U.S. population served in the military and are considered veterans. Of those, about 8.9 million are actually enrolled in the VA. And we provide care to about 6.5 million. So there's a couple million that are enrolled but just don't need care. And that's great. They don't need health care. Not, not bad. 
The thing is only about roughly over half of veterans are even eligible to get care in VA. There's eight priority categories. It's a fairly complicated system like anything in the government. But I think it's important to understand that not every veteran who served in the military is eligible to get care in the VA. Uh, but what people, when people ask me sometimes, uh, people that I know, they say, well, well, am I eligible? I usually ask them a couple questions and then I'll just say, you know what, just go online and just Google search, am I eligible for VA benefits? And it will walk you through it so easily. Um, but there are people I know that aren't eligible because of they make too money or they didn't serve at the right time and they just have to ask. W one of the both, I think, benefits and challenges that we have is about, um, about 80% of our veterans are dual eligible for other forms of, what, you know, I'll call it insurance, and I'll come back to what I mean by that. So they can get VA and non-VA health care that's paid for through some benefit. And of those, about half are Medicare, so people over 55 or other conditions get Medicare. About almost 30% have private insurance. About 12% have TRICARE through their experience in the DOD, you know, through the uh, Department of Defense. And about 10% have Medicaid. And so this creates opportunities for people to get care outside the VA, but it also creates challenges because of fragmentation. If you can imagine, you know, we have a lot of people who have two primary care providers. They have a primary care provider in the VA and they have one outside the VA. And if you can you know, have two people managing your health care, it's a challenge. And so I th I'm going to come back to this at the very end about this is where I think one of our opportunities are. So the Institute of Medicine is a non-governmental organization that, that puts out a lot of very interesting reports. And one of theirs, they initially started in 1999 called Cro uh, uh, Crossing the Quality Chasm, or um, actually that was the second one in 2001. But anyway, the first one, they came up with what they said, the six aims of an ideal healthcare system, okay? And I wanna go through these and explain them what they mean, and they seem, may seem obvious, so it'll only take a few minutes. Then I'm gonna talk about how I see the VA meeting these aims, and in some ways maybe not meeting it. So the first is that our system should be safe, and this is a picture of Hippocrates, and when we take the Hippocratic Oath, we're supposed to say, you know, first do no harm. It's actually, um, actually the way it was written was, the physician must have two special objects in view with regard to disease, mainly to do good and to do no harm. And certainly we try, but it's sometimes, you know, we don't always succeed. Um, what has, I think, evolved past just the provider giving care and being safe is that the system has to be safe. There are a lot of things that an individual can do to make things unsafe, but if the system makes things safer for everybody, you know, we can catch errors before they reach a patient. So I think that's um, the evolution from the individual to the system being safe. The second is to be effective, and this is to give care that's evidence-based, that we know is effective in the treatment and management or the diagnosis of diseases. And we have to be careful that we don't over-treat conditions and that we don't under-treat. And this is, you know, uh, Goldilocks and the porridge, I guess. Sometimes you don't want too much and you don't want too little, you want it just right. And, and I think the entire healthcare system ch is challenged with that. But I think we have to determine what is the most highly effective care so that we can make sure that patients are getting the quality that they need and deserve. It's also a challenge sometimes to measure quality care. People say, well, I know good care when I get it. Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. There's a lot of things that I perceive that might be good or bad, but uh, uh, outside of areas that I know, I can take my car in, I think they fix it, but I, I don't know if they're giving me a good service or not. The next is that, that care should be patient-centered. And patient-centered means a lot of different things to, to different people. Some people thinks, think it means that we just have to give patients all the choice, possible choices and let them pick. Um, but really what, what patient-centered care is, is shared decision-making. That we make decisions with patients that meets their needs, their values, their patients, their family's needs. And sometimes patients are very, uh, doctor-centered, we call it. They're, they just want to be told what to do, and they want to be told, take this pill or that pill. And if that's what they want, we can do that, but we also have to be flexible for the people who want uh, to be actively engaged in their decision-making. Um, timely. So the Institute of Medicine describes this, the, a problem with timeliness when there's unintended waiting that doesn't provide information or a time to heal. 
And the waiting and access to care has been the huge thing that's been in the, the media lately, and I'm gonna come back to that a little bit more. Um, I actually have a picture here of Dr. Ignacio Ponsetti. Dr. Ponsetti was an orthopedic surgeon here at the university uh, for many years. He died a few years ago in his 90s. Actually, uh, um, originally was a surgeon in the Spanish Civil War. That's how old he was. He'd been around a really long time. Um, but he gave probably one of the best stories I ever heard about timeliness and, and care. And he said he was, he was he was a visiting professor and some young orthopedic resident is presenting a case to him, a surgical case, and says, you know, Dr. Ponsetti, what should we do now? And Dr. Ponsetti said to him, he says, you should get the patient to the operating room right away because if you don't, this problem will go away all by itself. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that, you know, may seem obvious that should be taken right away and we have to fix this right away, but some things need to need to wait. And what he did was he developed a method for treating club foot, the club feet, um, that required no scalpels, no surgery, no cutting of the skin, but slowly manipulated the feet back into their natural position using manipulation and casts. And he was sort of a heretic in his field because everybody said, no, you got to cut the feet open and you got to break the bones and you got to reset them. And that's how you fix club feet. And his methods used all around the world. And, uh, and he was right here in Iowa City. Okay, efficient. Uh, we could talk for hours about some of the inefficiencies in the US healthcare system. Uh, this is just a graph and you don't have to be able to read all the countries. But you can guess which is the red, or the one at the top, the red line. This is healthcare spending as a percent of gross domestic product as a way to measure how much we spend. I mean, we spend more per capita than any other uh, industrialized country, almost $9,000 per capita. Um, as a percent of GDP, we're up to about 18% of GDP goes into healthcare. It's an incredible amount of money that we spend on healthcare. And in fact, I and many people will argue we don't have the best healthcare in the world. And in fact, Don Berwick, who used to be the director of uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, he liked to say, in the United States, we don't have the best health care, we have the most health care. And we definitely have the most health care. If you want health care and can afford it or have insurance, you'll get it in this country. Um, so I think in many ways we, need, we can be more efficient. Oh, one other thing about efficiency gets into the sometimes the the issue of cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness is sometimes a dirty word, uh, especially in Washington, when we're trying to say is something cost effective? Because there are some people that believe that there is, you can't put a value on healthcare, that you can't put a value on somebody's life. That, you know, there's a value on everything. And I think to deny the fact that, that we, we can't look at cost effectiveness of, of things is, is a, it's not the right way to look at it. Some people like to say when we talk about cost effectiveness that we're rationing. Um, you know, rationing is sort of in the eye of the beholder and I think there's so many things that we all do in our personal lives that you know, our, we ration our time, we ration our money and I think in healthcare we, ha we have to be honest with ourselves that we have to ration things. Uh, nobody would argue that uh, we don't ration organs for donation. I mean, there's not a market to buy and sell organs. If we said there, you know, we, we de tend to depend, depend on people donating them. But we could just put a market out there and let people sell them. You don't want one of your kidneys, you could just sell it. And, and I don't think that's the way we should go. Okay, last is equitable. And uh, that the receipt of high quality care should be independent of gender, race, ethnicity, and income. And I think this sometimes gets into the question of is, is health care a human right? And I don't want to get in that debate because I think there are some people that don't believe it's a human right. They think it's something that you either earn or that you pull yourselves up by your bootstraps and, and you know you get health care uh, however you can get it, um, but it's not a human right. Um, I think right now it's an interesting time because of the increased opportunities people have to get health care uh, through the Affordable Care Act. And I'm going to talk about that at the very end and what the potential implications are for VA. So, how does the VA do in all these, these six ones? So I'm gonna go through each one of them individually. I think the first one is on safety. 
the VA developed a safety culture in the late nine, in the mid to late 90s that really preceded other healthcare systems and how we looked at safety. Um, do we get everything right? Absolutely not. Um, but one of the first things in the, in the late, late 90s that we implemented was an electronic medical record. I mean, we were ahead of every other healthcare system in establishing an electronic medical record. I can look up the medical records of any, you know, any veteran in the country from my desk. And if they get care in the VA, it's in there. There's no, you know, other healthcare systems don't do that. And we did that starting in the late 90s. And I remember, well, I guess it would have been about 1999, maybe 2000, I was on call at the VA uh, the night that they turned the switch where you could no longer write a paper order. And I didn't go to my training like I was supposed to. There's a lot of trainings in the VA. So I showed up. And I was going to write an order. I'm looking for the chart. And I said to the clerk, where's the chart? She said, there is no chart. I'm like, no, but I need to write an order. She's like, nope, you got to do it on the computer. I'm like, oh, I don't know how to do that. But I quickly figured it out. And it's a great, it's a great system. So I think safety is something the VA has adopted through electronic medical record, barcoding for medications. We were the first system to do that. Um, we do a lot of root cause analyses to try to identify problems within the system and fix them. I think there are two reasons why the VA adopted this sort of safety culture. One is that, you know, we are under the microscope all the time by patients, their family members, congressmen. There is somebody always looking over our shoulder. And I think that's a good thing. I, I don't mind the fact that somebody's paying attention to what I'm doing. And, and I, I personally like that environment to be in, that somebody's paying attention. The second thing is safe care is more cost-effective care. There is not a harm that comes to patients that, does, that saves money. I mean, unless the patient dies and then you don't have to pay for anything else, but that's not a good way to look at the, you know, an error to a patient. So errors only cost us money. So I think uh, any ways that we can be safer is better for the system. The next is on under having an effective system. And I think that the VA, since I've been there, has really evolved into a, an organization that really does try to learn uh, how to do things better. And I know it doesn't seem that way when you watch the news because there's always something that we're getting beat up for. Um, but I can tell you since I've been there for 15 years, uh, this constantly looking at ways to improve. I think there's a couple things that drive it. One is the fact that we're not a fee-for-service uh, healthcare system. Most of the, the world, most of our country is not, but runs on a fee-for-service type of, of system where if I do something, I get paid to do it. Uh, that's just the way our system evolved with health insurance. You bought insurance, the insurance paid your bills, you never had to pay the doctor or the health the hospital anything, your insurance just paid for it. I mean, when my dad was a doctor down in Donaldson, Iowa, he just submitted a bill and the insurance companies paid it. Patients didn't pay anything. Um, but we do everything, everything as part of a salary. I just get paid one salary. If I do more procedures or I see more patients, I don't get paid more for it. I think the other reason that the VA can be more effective in managing patients is that everybody in the system has the same benefit. They have the same insurance. Now, VA is not an insurance, but basically everybody that I take care of in the hospital, I know can afford their medications. I know that they're not going to become bankrupt because they ended up with a uh, you know, a 30 or 40 day hospital stay because of some catastrophic illness and now they go home and are completely bankrupt because there's no way they'll ever pay that hospital bill. I know that when they go home, if they need home care, we'll pay for it. If they need to go to a nursing home, either through their, through Medicare or their insurance or through the VA, it will be paid for. And to me, that is such a comfort because when I used to see patients at the university hospital, that was one of the biggest challenges I had was Every patient I had to say, well, what is your insurance? What do you have to pay for? What is your copay for this? And in the VA, you know, everybody has the same, essentially the same. There's a few small differences. The last thing I think on effectiveness that the VA did was we recognized we can't do everything every, at every clinic, at every hospital. So we did something where we regionalized high cost, high risk things. So like heart surgery. We don't do bypass surgery here in Iowa City. But if a veteran needs bypass surgery, we have them done in Minneapolis, where they do you know, five or 10 a day. Because otherwise, we do three or four a week. And you don't get good at something if you're not doing it all the time. 
I think some people see that as an inconvenience that if we have to send them to Minneapolis for heart surgery, but it's really an incredible benefit for them. The same as something like kidney transplant. There's only five VA hospitals that do kidneys, kidney transplants, and we're one of them. And so we have patients that come from all over the country to get their kidney transplant done here because we're really good at it. Okay, on patient-centered. Um, I remember back reading an article about 2000, in the year 2000, so that was about eight years after the first Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm, and it was a year before 9-11. We hadn't had a war in a few years, and there was serious talk that we will do not need the VA, that the VA will become obsolete. All the World War II veterans were dying at about 1,000 a day, and let's just get rid of it. Let's sell all the VA properties. There's a lot of really valuable ones out there. Let's sell them and just give everybody an insurance card, just like we do with Medicare or with TRICARE, and get rid of the system. I'm really thankful they didn't do that, uh, and then 9-11 happened, and then it wasn't going to happen after that once the global war on uh, terror started. But I think veterans and the veteran service organizations really fought hard to prevent that from happening because what they said was that the VA is their health care system. It's something that, that the people who work there, the system understands them, understands their unique needs, it understands their needs that they have related to war trauma and PTSD. and Every war has had unique things, that were, you know, with, whether it be Gulf War syndrome after the first Gulf War, and with this past, you know, war that's continuing, lots of traumatic brain injury that, you know, you have to have very specialized care for. Something like amputees, you know, we have thousands of amputees. Are there other healthcare systems that are really equipped to handle all the needs of amputees or polytrauma patients? Absolutely not. And so to get that specialized care, um, we can do it in the VA, and it's very patient-centered. I think the area that we've evolved the most on is on women's health. Uh, over, well, just even a few years ago, there was a less than 5% of veterans were women. Now it's right about 10%, and 15% of, of active duty military are women. And so the VA has had to really evolve. I mean, I remember I was at a meeting a few years ago in um, Portland, Maine, and um, you know, it was something as simple as not having tampon dispensers in the women's bathrooms because they weren't used to having things like that because there weren't enough women to offer these services. And I th we still have a ways to go, but I think we're getting better. Uh, timely. So this is, goes back to this issue of the waiting lists and the things that happened in uh, Phoenix. Uh, I've read a number of the reports. I reviewed the uh, Office of Inspector General's report again this morning. And, you know, it, it's unfortunate. I think it's both fortunate and unfortunate. I think it's fortunate in that it identified a few issues that we do need to fix. I think it's unfortunate, and I think it, it mischaracterized a lot of what was going on with the way that patients are scheduled into the VA system. And what I mean by that is there are some artificial metrics that we, were, we have been asked to follow. Uh, getting every patient to be seen within 30 days for certain, certain specialties is not a realistic expectation. Uh, some things don't need to be seen within 30 days, and some things, frankly, get better by themselves if you just let them give it enough time. But I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a New York Times article a few months ago right after this all happened, and the author went to the major metropolitan areas and got wait times for specialty care. And in Boston, as an example, if you want to see a cardiologist, it's 27 days. If you want to see a primary care doctor in Boston, it's 67 days. You want to see a cardiologist, it's 72 days. Average wait time. And to expect that our entire healthcare system will have everybody seen exactly within 30 days for every condition, in my opinion, is, is unrealistic. But we're doing our best. Uh, last two on efficiency and equitable. I think efficiency. Again, this could be a whole other uh, discussion and a whole other panel. Um, it's estimated we spend about $5,000 per uh, patient per year. Medicare, it's about $6,500. Um, a lot of our patients get care outside of VA, so it's really hard to say what the total cost of care is. But I would argue that we have actually a fairly efficient healthcare system. Now, you could privatize it. 
And at, I just read that if you want to buy a, the median cost for a health insurance uh, is $328 a month for an individual, which comes out to right at $4,000. So uh, if we wanted to buy every veteran private health insurance, it would cost about $4,000. But I, I, again, I don't think that would provide what they want. And the last is under equitable. I think this is probably the number one reason that I chose to work in the VA. And like I said, you know, when I come in every day, I know that all my patients have the, an equitable insurance. It's, again, it's not insurance, but the benefit that they have in the VA is fair for everybody. Everybody that comes in gets seen. So I do admit that we have ways that we can improve to be more equitable, but it, it is a highly equitable system. And I can say that in that we've done research in the past when you look at racial disparities. Racial disparities outside the VA actually can be quite significant, but a lot of that is driven by uh, socioeconomic status but once you're, and insurance, but once you're in the VA, most of that goes away. Okay, I have a last couple minutes here. I'm just gonna talk about my, my predictions for the future. So just came out yesterday, um, the secretary, Dr. Or, uh, Robert McDonald, uh, I read this last night over a plate of Chinese food, The Blueprint for Excellence. It's a 42-page document. Uh, it has a lot of good things in it. It's, um, um, I'm gonna actually have another slide on it, but that's one of the things that I think is gonna guide what we do. The Veterans Access Choice and Accountability Act of 2014, or the Veterans uh, Choice Act, was 17 billion that was uh, passed earlier this year. I'll mention that briefly. I'm gonna mention the Affordable Care Act and how that uh, impacts, I think, the VA. And the last thing on coordination of care. So I think those are the th four big areas. So the Blueprint for Excellence had four themes and 10 strategies. I didn't write all the strategies down because it would take too many words on a slide. But the four themes are right there, improving performance, promoting a positive culture of service, advanced healthcare innovation, increase operational effectiveness and accountability. I, I, I think that there's, these are the things that we have been doing. I think we need to look at them again. Uh, and I think this blueprint is gonna be helpful. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot more time reading it because I, I, it's not too specific, but I think there are some things that we can learn from it. The Veterans Choice Act. This is a, a really uh, interesting um, piece of legislation. Uh, one of the components of it is to provide care closer to home for veterans and this is right off of a, a one-page summary that I, I, so I got the words wording right today, that you can get local care, and it's through a VA contract, so it's through a provider, it, through an intermediary, intermediary. If you live more than 40 miles from a VA facility, and that's 40 miles by the crow flying, not by driving, um, and so veterans that live 40 miles from a VA facility on November 4th, they were mailed a card that will, uh, eventually give them access to care locally. Or veterans who have to wait more than 30 days for care from their preferred, preferred visit date when they want to be seen or the date that their provider feels is medically necessary. So it could be that somebody says, I want to be seen tomorrow. And I say, well, you don't need to be seen tomorrow for that. We can, you can be seen in three weeks um, as long as they're seen when it's medically necessary. So the cards were mailed. I think this is gonna be a huge challenge for coordination, which is the last comment I'm gonna make on the last slide. Uh, it is really hard to manage people across multiple healthcare systems. It is a huge challenge. And um, I try to encourage patients that I see, you know, I want you to use other doctors if that's what you want, but you have to remember that we don't have access to their records and they don't have access to ours easily. And this makes coordination very, very difficult. Uh, my opinion of this is not that this will not likely be permanent. It might be, but I don't think it will be. I think uh, it's going to be very hard to manage even administratively, and I think in the long run, it's probably not going to be uh, a, a huge value, get my opinion. Now, part of the, the, this act also did pay for more providers, which is, uh, um, which is interesting because uh, in a lot of markets, it's the fact that we don't have providers is not because we don't have the money, it's that they aren't there to hire. So if we had unlimited supply of physicians and nurses and uh, nursing assistants, we'd hire them, we just can't hire them. Okay, last two things on the Affordable Care Act. Um, I've been, I used to do work for VA Central Office for the Office of Rural Health, and we did a lot of analysis of what would happen with the Affordable Care Act before, right after it was, it was passed actually. 
And um, then VA hired some consultants. And what we really came up with was that it probably isn't going to make a whole lot of an impact. And what I mean by that is there's not going to be a lot of people leaving the VA for uh, private insurance. And there's probably not a lot of people coming in for insurance. But I think ultimately the greatest benefit is that they will have more choices. And that's, that's really the, you know, if somebody has a choice that they can go out and get a plan through the exchange that provides care for them and their family, that's fantastic. Uh, but if they want to come to the VA, we're happy to take care of them. Okay, last slide here on coordination of care. I think this is really the most important thing that as a healthcare system, that if we can figure out how to do this, we will vastly improve the care that we provide. And that's care between the VA and the private sector. I mean, we even, we do a good job with the University of Iowa We're right across the street. We roll people, well, we don't roll them anymore. We have to use an ambulance, but we send people back and forth all the time. And I think we do a pretty good job. But even there, sometimes we have failures in communication and can affect patients in, a, in an adverse way. You know, between the VA and other governmental agencies, um, uh, um, Congressman said that, you know, people do try to work together in D.C. sometimes, and occasionally they do, but we worked on a memorandum of understanding with the Indian Health Service, and it took us two years uh, to get a document approved between, these, between VA and the Indian Health Service. And, you know, it just seemed like the simplest, most basic thing to agree upon, and we still took forever to get it done. Uh, federally qualified health clinics, another opportunity for people to uh, uh, coordinate between VA. I think electronic health records, we're doing better. We're still not all exchanging medical records the way we should, but we're getting close. And I think lastly, between providers and patients and having better communication between our providers and patients. So I think good communication is critical to have this safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable health care system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cavoli. I'm going to next ask all the members of our panel to please come forward. And Larry, if you would like to join us as well. Well, while we're doing that, I would like to give a special welcome to those who are watching us on live stream or maybe watching this later off the Public Policy Center website or other places where you'll be able to download this and hopefully you'll be able to benefit from it later. I also uh, would like to again thank the staff, the Public Policy Center, Leslie Gannon, Stephen Williams, and Christy Fitzpatrick for all of their help putting this together. So thank you very much. And so we've got an excellent group of reactors here today with us. And we've asked that they each say about five minutes and then hopefully be able to engage in some lively banter about the topic. And I'm just going to go down the row here and briefly introduce each of them and then each of them uh, say a few words. Uh, first, we have Alan Roberts, and Alan runs the Military and Veteran Student Services Office at the University of Iowa. Uh, prior to coming to Iowa City last spring, he worked with student veterans in similar capacity at Portland State um, prior to that, and is a veteran himself, um, is also a uh, journalist uh, prior to coming here, and so he's got a very interesting perspective working with many people from around campus. Uh, next to him is uh, close to office mate, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Albrecht, and the Public Policy Center is on the second floor of South Quad, and the Army ROTC and the Air Force ROTC have the first floor, so we pass in the hallway routinely, and it's nice to be able to collaborate with them. Uh, he's a 1997 graduate of the University of Washington, um, in cell and molecular biology, which we don't always necessarily think of as someone who is going to be um, here in the ROTC program. Um, also has his Master of Military Arts and Sciences and Operational Arts and Sciences from the U.S. Army Air Command. Um, and he's also uh, very thoughtful on these kinds of issues when we just cross paths in the building. Uh, next to him is Gary Marquardt, and Gary is obviously a veteran, but he's also the immediate, if you get the term correctly, past commander for the state VFW. Yes, sir. And is also the legislative liaison for the state. So he's been going back and forth to Washington and is tied in with some of the policy discussions that are going on about the future of the VA. Can you give us a little bit of that perspective? Uh, next to him is Aaron Sniff. 
And Aaron is a social worker with the Iowa City VA Hospital and obviously has a lot of perspective on returning veterans and the issues that they have to deal with. And uh, she is a veteran herself, uh, former um, hospital corpsman in the Navy. And on her left, from our perspective, is Larry Lockwood. And Larry is a registrar here with the University of Iowa, a Vietnam veteran and a user of the VA and has as I understand it, for about the past 25 years or so? 44 years. Excuse me, 44, 44 years. years. 44 years, a couple more. Doesn't look like it would be that long, but. So like we've asked them each to just say about five words from their perspective on things and then be able to have discussion. So, Alan, we'll start with you. Um, I think it. I come kind of, my optics are focused on the students a lot because I work with them and I have worked with them for almost 10 years, but uh, I also was a user of the VA. I, I like how it's kind of like a confession I use the VA. Like it's Alcoholics Anonymous or something. But um, I'm, I'm hopefully going to be the panel member here that has a lot of questions for everybody because I kind of, I, I don't think from this 500 foot view like a lot of people do, I really care about the microclimate, how things are affecting folks now. And uh, healthcare is intimidating and I want to know, I think, how to help. And so I think that that's why when I was asked to be a part of this, I was kind of flattered because I have a lot of questions I want to ask. Yeah, could you just briefly, what are you seeing from the students and those that you're exposed to in terms of their their care from the VA and, and just care in general. And one of the things that was very obvious from Dr. Caboli's presentation that I think most people don't always recognize is that most veterans are not users of the VA. And so they're either not eligible or even if they're eligible, they may use it or only use it for part of their care. And that can be sort of challenging at times on how to negotiate that system. Do you see that as an issue with students here? Yeah, the healthy people don't use it. That's what's interesting about it, I think. And, and they also have the, um, the, the school provided health care. That, that's confusing, and if you know if they're covered under the uh, under the GI Bill, the post 11 GI Bill, 100 percent, then that covers that. So it's it's good to have both insurers, and it sounds like from your presentation that that's advantageous to the VA as well. It's just curious that they don't use it, they don't access it, they don't feel the need to. It's uh, and so I'm curious about that as well, and see because you know any any talk about the future, the VA is going to have to talk about you know folks now from OEF, OIF, OND that are going to be their customers essentially. And how do you best serve those customers? Because they're not going to look the same as the Vietnam veterans. They're not going to look the same as the World War II veterans. And so I think it's, it's important to just keep our eye on the ball with regards to who's it going to be in the future and how can we most, what, what behooves us in the right way to set those things forward. And uh, I think the students are a good people to talk to because they're upwardly mobile. They're going to be educated. They're going to have jobs. They're going to have the health care that's provided by their employers. How do they fit into the VA system? I think it's important to ask those questions and think about them because that's a majority of the folks. I'm talking a lot, sorry, I'm passionate about this. No, that's, <laughs> that's, that's what we want. All right, thank you. And Lieutenant Colonel Burke, we've kind of asked you to speak from a person who might become a user of the VA, and given from what you're hearing, I know this is just your perspective and not the perspective of the Army, the same disclaimer uh, that Dr. <laughs> Bully had to give, but what are some of the things that you're thinking about or have been hearing from people? And I will have to be sure you could grab a microphone when you talk to so that the, the people yeah. the, on the live stream can be here. Uh, well, first, I want to say Happy Veterans Day. Um, and you know, when you asked me to sit on the panel, I had obviously a little bit of trepidation. You know, we we're talking about policy in the Veterans Administration, uh, not uh, subjects that currently serving military members uh, are uh, eager to dive into. I don't think. Um, you know, my personal perspective uh, from my personal perspective as a currently serving. Uh, member in the armed forces is that you know I receive you know world class health care uh, whenever I need it. Uh, if my family is ill, uh, my children are ill, or they just have a health uh, checkup they have to go uh, get an annual physical, or if I have a health care need, uh, I go to my uh, local medic and my medic points me in a certain direction. I get a sick call slip, I go to the hospital if I need to, they draw blood, take x-rays or whatever, uh, and I have that health care provided to me. Um, and again, I think it's world class. I've had nothing but the best of service uh, since I've been in the military. Um, I've been in the Army for 24 years. Uh, I served as an enlisted soldier for two years, was in the National Guard for four years, uh, and came back into the Army uh, as an officer in 1997. And it's been that way the entire time I've served. Uh, great health care, great service from great leaders and uh, great health care workers everywhere I've been. So from my perspective, uh, like Alan, you know, I have a lot of questions. Um, 
and again, kind of this discussion of you know concern uh, about what the future holds. Um, just like the healthcare I receive now, when I retire and leave the service, you know, I would love to be able to go to the Veterans Administration and receive that same quality, same type of healthcare uh, in the future uh, for my family. Okay, thank you. And Gary, what are what have you learned from your trips to Washington, and what are you hearing from your federal fellow veterans? Well, as as my job. Number one is being commander of the VFW, past commander, and on the National Legislative Council is being a veterans advocate. And also being served by the Iowa City VA healthcare system for the last 20 years. And the thing that I try to impart on everyone is at this time we have approximately 1% or less than 1% of our population as veterans serving right now. But the wounds that are coming back are horrific. Uh, how many of you guys are Vietnam veterans out here? I see one I know well, another one, another one on the end. In our time of war, the veterans that are coming back today would have never made it. I think the last statistic that I looked at said that if our veterans got health care within seven minutes, now I'm talking about a corpsman slapping a, a patch on you, today you would make it back. We're seeing a tremendous influx of young veterans. The health care system suffered a lot from years ago and it's suffering now not from the health care system itself, but the perception that the older veterans, the Vietnam veterans, the World War II veterans had of that. And our fathers told us about the VA health system. And this is one of the main things we have to overcome. Our systems here in Iowa City and system in Des Moines are some of the highest ranked VA hospitals in the country. We have an excellent system. Are they great? Yes. Can they be improved? Yes. And I think that's what we're here to discuss. That's there's only one person, in my opinion, that is going to change VA health care. It's not the officers or the congressmen. It's, it's not just a panel. It's every veteran sitting in this audience and every veteran that we know, they are the ones that have to change VA health care. And we have a good system. We have to improve it. Our new uh, Veterans of McDonald has a few things which we of the VFW and other service organizations have been preaching for years. That's get the VSOs involved. And just reading as his uh, letter in his release letter here, uh, the changes in the VA that they're doing in his, his uh, re reorganization plan, he's met with the veteran service officers, service organizations and had them help implement some of the changes that are coming. And I've, later we'll, I'll entertain any questions that I can answer on some of the stuff that's coming through. The VFW has a very good program that we just did in September before this ever came out. And when they asked me to come up here, the name of the report is the VFW's report on the state of VA healthcare. It's a 22-page report uh, that we did 16 VA hospital surveys. So if you can, when I ask me any questions on that, I'll be glad to take them later. Okay. Thank you, Gary. And Aaron, what are you seeing at the VA and challenges? Well, I'm, I'm seeing a lot. I, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. When Dr. Cabale called me last week and said, Aaron, you're a veteran, uh, you'd be great to, to give your perspective on this. Um, the reality is uh, I served four years during peacetime. Um, I never saw a foreign deployment during my whole time in the service. Um, what I've learned about being a veteran comes from the veterans I've served the last 10 years at the Iowa City VA in the capacity of a social worker. Um, every morning I wake up 
remind myself of, of our motto that was excerpted out of uh, President Lincoln's second inaugural address, to care for those who have borne the battle. Okay, that's what the VA does, to treat those who have given their time, talents, service, their health, and their lives in many cases for our country, and that's our mission. Okay. What we're seeing today is an enormous influx of veterans in need. Okay, we have had our longest here, continuous period of war in our nation's history. Okay, we've sent you know, more than half of a million people into combat in the last 10 plus years now. Um, they're coming home from multiple deployments, which is unprecedented in our past periods of war. I've worked and sat and, and dealt with veterans who are dealing with combat trauma, not from one deployment, but from seven deployments. 32 years old, and you've gone back to the battlefield seven times since the age of 18. That's unprecedented, and the trauma and the wounds, they really go deep, okay? That's the VA's greatest challenge is how are we going to deal with their needs, not today, not tomorrow, but for the decades to come. Our Vietnam veterans have shown us that the issues they bring home from war may not be present the day they come home. They'll be present in 10 years, in 20 years later, okay? Vietnam veterans didn't come home with cancer from Agent Orange. Those only showed up 15, 20, 30 years later. This current population of veterans are going to have needs that the VA is expert in. Okay. People ask me, you know, they get all excited about the card they received in the mail, and I've received calls to my office saying, what do I do with this now? Does this mean I can't come back to the VA? Okay. I tell them you can always come back to the VA. Okay? There are things that they'll take to a local doctor. Well, and I, and I have veterans who we contract care for. You know, they, they live three, four hours away from the VA hospital. They can't get here. They don't have means of transportation, so we've been contracting their care at a local provider. And they call me and say, gosh, Aaron, I'm just not getting what I need. This doctor doesn't understand me. This therapist doesn't know how to treat combat PTSD. Okay. The VA is going to have, if we're going to engage in community-based care, we're going to pay for care in the community. We better make sure those providers know how to use evidence-based treatments to deal with the issues that the veterans are bringing to their door. We're going to have to have a role in training them and making sure we're providing the appropriate care even if it's not inside our four brick walls, okay? We also have to care for our aging population of veterans. We have an ever-increasing group of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam-era veterans who are in need of quality, long-term care. Iowa doesn't have enough nursing home beds to accommodate them. Iowa has one veteran's home with a finite number of beds, okay? The VA has expanded services through our caregiver support program, trying to get veteran family caregivers the help they need in the home, but not everybody can stay at home. So we as the VA have to work with community partnerships to make sure that our veterans, those who bore the battle, receive the health care they need even if that means we're gonna to have to contract with more nursing homes to do it. And making sure those nursing homes are providing good care. We have to have oversight. They're our responsibility, regardless where they're receiving their care. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And Larry, as a user, 44 years. 44 years, and um, free shots every year. <laughs> uh, one of the things, uh, in 1970 when I returned, I came back as a combat wounded veteran and spent six months in the hospital and uh, received a, a new right leg and was sent back out into the community. It took me almost a year to get a new leg. So the leg had 
trunk <clears throat> and it was very difficult to get around and I had to use crutches. The VA was not ready for the number of wounded people that came back from Vietnam. And there were many amputees, arms, legs, because we got care immediately through helicopters. You could be on the operating table in 10 minutes. Very similar to what's happening in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. If we can get them to the hospital, we can get them repaired. Severely wounded people made it back. Um, that care after Vietnam got better because now we have closer clinics. Back then I went to the Madison Hospital, I went to a Chicago hospital, and when I came here to Iowa, I went to the Iowa VA hospital. Now you have clinics and communities. We didn't have it back then. We got a little card where we went to a local clinic to get treated, and many of the doctors didn't know how to handle injuries that were created in war. So we'd end up going back to the VA hospital for treatment. Over time, and I've always been treated at a VA hospital, that's where my primary care is at, I've received excellent care and care has improved over time. And the U.S. government often doesn't give the VA enough money to handle those veterans who return from war. And that's what we're seeing today. Now the influx of money comes, we're gonna be able to help these vets that are here. And then over the long term, it's not just in 1970 that I was wounded, but I've had to take care of this for the last 44 years and will for the hope the next 30. <laughs> okay, we're going to open up to questions, but before we do, I, I had mentioned that we're live streaming this, and I just want to give a little shout out, thank you to the Office of Strategic Communications and our students that are here filming, and to Alex Sikulski, who is our IT Director of IT Services at the Public Policy Center, for helping to make all of this happen. Um, so, welcoming any questions that anyone might have, if you want to just stand up and call it out and I'll repeat it so that people um, can hear what it is. And I will start by Dr. Caboli. You had talked about some of the things about a good healthcare system. And I'm also a health policy researcher and one of the things that I mention all the time is that in the United States, we don't have a healthcare system. We have a series of healthcare sectors. So where do you think you sort of alluded to that, but where, where do you think that makes the VA better, and where do you think it adds additional challenges? <clears throat> so I, th I think the way it makes it better is that, th again, the people that are in our system, you know, I argue, and many other people do, that, that they get the best care, best care anywhere, and there's actually a book called Best Care Anywhere, and there, it, it outlines what it is that we do that is so good. But I think the, the biggest challenge, though, is this fragmentation that we're seeing, in, and we've seen it for a long time. Um, we've done work looking at, the, at uh, veterans' use of VA health care, and 50% of them in this area have a primary care provider outside the VA. When you have two people managing your blood pressure or your heart disease or your diabetes, it's just not a coordinated care. And it, we don't know that it's actually unsafe, and nobody's shown it's unsafe, but we do know that it's inefficient. So if you have two different people prescribing medications, I've had patients come into the hospital and they're getting medications from multiple providers outside the VA and then they come to the VA and we give them pills too. Now our job then is to reconcile all that. But So I think, to answer your question, I think within the system, the people that are in the system I think do fairly well. I think it's when we have patients bouncing back and forth between that we have a lot of challenges. Aaron or anyone else, do you see or, or Gary see how that can run into things? Any, any issues? Yeah, uh, during the VFW study on hurry up and wait uh, on VF, VA healthcare, we did 1,600 uh, questionnaires at 16 hospitals throughout the United States. And those that were receiving their primary care through VA healthcare were satisfied. They thought they could care. The perception was the length of wait getting into the system and the promises that were made to veterans when they signed up years ago that said, we will provide you health care. And when some of the older veterans that's worked their life and, and they don't want to uh, oh, use up all their savings for this, come in and say, well, you make too much money right now. We can't do anything for you. Well, to veterans, that is not what VA healthcare 
was perceived to be. VA healthcare was to serve veterans. And listening earlier to the perspective about the types of environment, I agree with number one, a safe environment. But the thing that I think will probably solve everything is the patient concern. Your concern for patients, if you do that and you foster your whole health care on that perspective, you'll get more people into the health care system, they'll stay in the system, they'll stop going out because we will solve the long wait periods, we'll solve the perspective of not having the best care, and the rest of the, the priorities will fall in line. Number one, safety. Number two, concern and veterans' concern. And number three, training the doctors to recognize the presumptuous illnesses that are out there. You have your service officers, you have your, your workers, but the doctors themselves are not trained as far as the questions I've asked in certain facilities on how to properly write a a uh, diagnosis that will fly in the VA when the guy says, okay, I've, I'm Agent Orange, I have type 2 diabetes, I'm taking shots. Write that up in the perspective that he served in Vietnam and he is a presumptuous. You take that, that type of perspective coming in. And we have to change that perspective of the system to get that people to be more confident in it. They get more confident in the system, they will continue to stay in it. Uh, the length of time is a lot of it that I've heard. I want to go in and see my doctor for a cold. Well, it's going to take you three weeks. Well, a cold is three weeks can go into pneumonia when you're 80 years old. It doesn't perceive that. The one, one outlook that I've to been told in a couple hospitals is if you can't get in and see your primary care physician, tell them you're going to the emergency room and see how quick they work you into the system. So that's something that the perception has to be changed there. And then they'll stay in this system. Aaron, do you have? I, I can make a comment. Oh, you can also use the ones that are in front of you on, oh, okay. on the desk. Yeah, can you just pull this closer? I guess, I guess I can make this, uh, I make two points here. I see a lot of patients. I, I work in an acute care inpatient setting on my routine everyday basis. We have many, many um, admissions, the result of medication mix-ups and complications because, number one, um, the outside provider and the VA providers aren't capable of communicating and uh, the, the patients are getting duplicate medications or th these are correctable errors that I think uh, both sectors, as Dr. Kabali said, need to find a way to communicate if these veterans or if these patients and people we're caring for are going to seek dual services. We need to find a way to communicate. From a women's health care perspective, the VA's had a very difficult time recruiting women to come to the VA. And um, I, I mentioned that I was in the service myself and it's kind of a, it's an artifact from how we were treated in the military. We didn't get annual exams in the military for women, okay? There's no such thing as a pap smear in the DOD when I was in. It just didn't happen. When I approached the VA myself in 1985, the Navy had made my appointment at the VA comp and department and said, uh, you need to be down here at such and such time and get your evaluation done. I approached that desk and what they told me was, sweetheart, the veteran has to check in for himself. <laughs> 1995, I received my first letter from the VHA saying, we can now offer female veterans an annual exam. That was 10 years <laughs> after my service. So we're having a hard time selling this to, to women, okay? We've made a lot of progress though. We have women health clinics in every, in 153 VA hospitals in this country. We have. Uh, women program managers in every facility. We're supposed to be getting a women health specialist in every VA clinic, okay? This is really a far cry from where we've been, but it's gonna take a lot of effort to make sure that female veterans trust us 
to provide the care that we didn't necessarily receive with the DOD. Um, and it's going to take some work and effort on our part. I, I want to add from that, and I like, I, I noticed some reoccurring themes here. And uh, I know from when you mentioned changing the perception, the VA has a brand problem. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that. And uh, I, I think that changing the perception of what VA branded healthcare is would benefit. It would not only behoove folks like Colonel Albrecht, but it would also behoove folks that are healthy veterans that don't receive their health care from the VA, like myself. I'm registered here, but I get, I get perfectly good health care through my work. And I think that that's a vast majority of the you know, 22 million veterans that are out there right now. And I, I also think that it's important to look back on the past successes of the VA, because while the VA is an easy punching bag, and I can't believe that Dr. Hall and the staff over there at ICOV is changing my mind on the way that I feel about the VA, because it was always so fun to beat them up, and oh, the damn VA, that was always the excuse, blame the VA for everything. But after doing some research, and it was awesome that, that, that Dr. Kabuli also pointed this out, you know, the VA did some miraculous things in the 90s. Ken Kaiser was responsible for it, and you know, the, the way that it came is that, that book, uh, Best Care Anywhere, came out of a kind of a journalist looking for the, you know, the Jack Welch of healthcare. Fortune magazine sent him out to do it, and he found this mid-level bureaucrat at the VA that was actually changing the way that healthcare was being run, and no one wanted to read that story. Everyone wanted to beat up on, on the VA. And, you know, precariously, they were also facing funding difficulties like they are now. And so we've heard the song before, and we've seen returning veterans coming back for health care from war, and we've seen them coming to school. And I always think school is a good conduit because we get, you know, not to say that, you know, the higher achieving veterans, but, you know, they have a goal, they're ready. It, it's a perfect way to introduce them to the system. And so I think when you look back at the successes in addition to the GI Bill, which was wildly successful, uh, I think the female treatment, the treatment of the females in the VA has been miraculous. And, and just in my short 10 years of working with the VA, seeing women's clinics emerge. And that, you know, uh, in 2014, I think the projections are that there's going to be, you know, 20, 22 percent of the, the military population is going to be female. Being able to be agile and move like that, I think that's how we need to look forward and see how we're going to offer this health care to these folks, like Colonel Albrecht, who we're going to be getting out, like the ROTC folks who are here today. Uh, I, who, how are we going to sell this and make incentives where folks are going to want to come and work for the VA because I know we have a lot of veterans in school here and they all want to be trained to be clinicians and a lot of them don't get jobs at the VA. Why? Why, why can't we use the same mechanisms like the GI Bill or things to recruit talented folks to something like the VA? Because a lot of the veterans that I meet here that are in school, I feel like I'm preaching now, like I have to get up on my soapbox, but you know, they, they still have that sense of service. While we live, we serve is what a lot of them say. So they, after they're done with the military, they're like, yeah, I'm good with that. I, I kind of got the feeling for that and that wasn't really for me. However, I still want to help my fellow troops. I still want to help out. And it's, you know, it's hard to get to become a social worker or a doctor or someone like that. And so I think that if there are incentive plans, the GI Bill is only a 36-month entitlement, it's kind of hard to become a doctor on 36 months of benefits, you know. So I think it's also equally difficult to recruit talent at the VA. You know, the, the Vietnam veterans, we have a lot to thank for that, especially in the medical field. My sister's a physician's assistant, and they taught her in her school that the Vietnam veterans, the medics coming back from Vietnam, are going to change healthcare because of the, the acute skills that they developed while in the military and also were encouraged to pursue outside of the military as civilians. And I think we need to think about that. And I think that Dr. Bully had some good points in there. And I really want to think and hopefully, you know, engage you guys a little bit too about what, how are we going to change healthcare? Because it's going to have to change. Well, we have to keep in mind the current population we're serving. You have to look at the demographics on who is receiving the most healthcare from the VA. And it's the folks that are in priority one. They've seen the most growth. That's the folks that have, I think it's 50% or more disability service connected. And then priority six is seeing a huge increase too. And those are the folks that have just been put in for the, the kind of the peacetime conflicts, but they have disabilities and also Agent Orange, I think, the exposure for that. There's some stuff about nuclear and insulation and stuff like that. But so it's, it's, you know, it's something that they've learned now that they have to include because they have to treat these folks. And you don't see the largest growing demographic, which is the students that, are, that I see every day that are healthy and don't know that VA is even, the VA is even an option. So I think it's important to explore how we can think about that too, because you can't forget about them because they're the majority of the folks right. out there. And, and you mentioned physician assistants, and some of you may be aware that that profession grew out of the medics that came back in the Vietnam War with all this skill and experience, and they wanted to be able to do something for them, or with them, if you will, and not have that go to waste. And so a program started at Duke that was the first uh, physician assistant program that then spread all over and now providing a lot of primary care. And I think we need to prey on these ethos of, you know, service after service, and then also prey on those that, that the, the, the philosophy of VA is, and it's not for profit. I think that there's something important in that philosophy of not being for profit, for providing a service to folks, and getting paid and getting compensated, because I don't think anybody in here is going to disagree that doctors should not be compensated for the skills that they possess. But at the same time, having profit not be a motive, I think it does something to the, to the care providers. I really do. 
We had a question over here. So the, the question was that um, the Secretary of the VA mentioned recently about the goal of hiring something like 28,000 new physicians, 2,800 new psychiatrists, and a lot of behavioral mental health issues obviously associated with this, and does the choice plan that went in, is that going to be actually be able to fund this? Yes. And that was a big part of it was to hire more providers. Uh, I sort of alluded to the fact that it, if we wanted to hire 28,000 physicians tomorrow, there aren't out, they're not out there. So um, this is actually one of the really important things why the VA healthcare system is a huge training ground for physicians, for physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and nurses. And you know, a lot of you that have gotten care in VA have been cared for by medical students and nursing students, and, and I appreciate that because that's how we're training these people. Yeah, and then the VA secretary also was talking about increasing salaries to make it more competitive. And Peter, you've done a lot of work in rural VA settings. How challenging is that compared to others? So that, that's an area we worked on for the last few years. And, and one of the biggest challenges is really identifying where the needs are. And um, you'd think it'd be really easy to say, well, we need two providers here, or we need a nurse here, or we need a clerk there. And it's really hard. And uh, we, it, years of looking at it, we still, you know, it's a cha it's constantly changing workforce. I mean, right now in the in the oil sands up in the Dakotas, I mean, they are having some challenges there because there's this big influx of people that have moved in. But it's taxing every system up there: the school systems, the hospital systems, but also the VA is responding to say, how many providers do we need in you know in Bismarck or you know wherever up there? John. You know, it seems like we hear so much about the veterans and trying to help them. And my question has to do with veterans. So the Because to me, that's a big, important issue. I don't hear much about it. Right. Yeah. So the question has to do with the families in addition to the veterans themselves. Can I take that? Yes. Um, Ten years ago when I started at the VA, we offered individual therapy for the veteran. We now offer family therapy. So we, we've expanded mental health services to include our family care providers and their dependents. So we can, we can set up a, a system for bringing their teenage kids who are troubled about how dad's behaving after he came back from Afghanistan to the table. Uh, the VA also, uh, it's been two or three years now, uh, we have a newly minted caregiver support program. Uh, this is uh, intended to reach out to the veteran caregivers of severely injured veterans uh, to make sure to, number one, uh, give them the support they need to keep the veteran home. Instead of placing, you know, the 36-year-old uh, double amputee in a nursing home, you know, we keep them at home through using our care, caregiver support system. So the, the VA recognizes that the family is an integral part of that patient's recovery, and they are involving that, that family support system into the treatment plan now. Okay. I think we had one over here first. Yeah, my name is and I'm faculty at the College of Dentistry and the Dental Clinics here in Iowa. And my disclaimer is that this is my personal opinion, not that of the, the school of the university. <laughs> but I, I personally believe that every veteran should have universal access to dental care. It's, it's proven that it's essential for overall systemic health. So my question is, where is the VA, where is the system currently on making dental care universal available to all veterans, and then to try to level the playing field with respect to the type of dental services that are available in different hospitals around the country, because I see a big disparity between dental services that are available here compared to, let's say, in the last 
So, so the question had to do with the availability and access to dental services, both in general and whether they can get them, but then also because it varies a lot on what you can get where. I'll take first crack at it. Um, I don't disagree with you completely. I think that uh, I think it's a challenging thing to now establish an entire system of dental care within the VA healthcare system. So I think the VA and I don't I'm, I'm not part of those discussions. You know, has to decide: do you make it or do you buy it? You know, and any organization has to decide these things. Um, it was about a year or so ago, and Pete, you may remember when they uh, uh, they expanded the um, dental program for veterans that they could buy into. Um, anyway, it's a, so you can buy into a dental insurance program as a veteran at a discounted rate. And personally, if they were up to me, that's what I'd do is give them dental, you know, give them a dental insurance. Because for us to then establish dental clinics at every CBOC, it's a community-based outpatient clinic, every VA hospital is just not feasible, in my opinion. And any other comments? Aaron, do you see anything about need for dental care? Um, I, I do agree. There, there is a disparity on who gets dental care at the VA and who doesn't. There, there's a, a clear de delineation. And, uh, but I think it, when I asked about it early on in my career at the VA, it was explained to me that we're kind of following the pub public sector model. You know, as a federal employee, um, if a dental insurance isn't part of my package, okay, um, I have to buy it as an extra. Um, my husband, who works in the private sector at Rockwell Collins, uh, now dental insurance, his, his employer thinks dental insurance is important enough that, that they give it to them. So, you know, how it was explained to me in my orientation to the VA and the VA benefits and learning all about this is that when uh, dental services came about, um, they offered them to 100% service-connected veterans. They stuck maybe one, do one dentist in each hospital and to take care of that problem. Uh, but um, they were following the public model in where people had to go and seek dental services independently and on their own. And I don't think we've ever restructured that. I have a comment on that. that one of the things about dental health care is not so much the cost of dental health care to the VA but the cost of the self-esteem to the veteran. If you take a veteran that's suffering from dental care needs, fix his teeth, give him a good set of dentures, send him out a little bit, he has a better perspective of himself. He, he feels better about himself. And I think whatever we can do to help that veteran, because that improves his mental health at the same time. And with us losing 22 veterans a day to suicide, anything that we can do to help their mental health and their self-esteem is what we should be doing. Whether it's farming out VA dental care to dentists, we have a dental school right here that is probably packed, but we have dental schools throughout the United States that I think the VA healthcare could use. And maybe it's not a pick and choose, but we need to take some of the consideration of self-esteem in there and how the veteran's gonna feel about himself rather than, well, you're just 100%, so there's the only ones that can get treated. We need to also make some exceptions in that to help that help that veteran gave me self-esteem, getting back out and making productive. And that's my personal opinion, just from working in it. And I received dental health care at the VA. I spent from 65 to 73 in the service. And um, I think here at Iowa City, at our health care at the VA, we have some of the best there is. And I've used the University of Iowa Health Care and the VA Health Care, and they're very good at what they do. And I think we need to get them involved and get their perspective on how these veterans come in and how they feel. Get this woman right here involved, saying, hey, we, we've got veterans that need help with their self-esteem. Get, get our mental health professionals involved. I think that would help. Part of the cause that we need to do is take care of those that really need it 
Just don't limit it to 100%. Well, I think he just put you in charge, Dr. Williamson, you and Dr. Hall, and how to convince the VA that it's cost effective to have dental coverage long term. Let's go ahead and start working on that. <laughs> don't think I won't be working on it. And, and you have no financial interest in this conversation. <laughs> I need a disclaimer. Everybody has a disclaimer. So the comment was about if we really wanted increased access to dental services, we'd be, take a congressional act to be able to do that. It would be. Okay. Yes. So the question had to do with uh, the, our speaker is a nurse practitioner deals with pain management issues and opioids that you might get both within the VA and outside and that the systems aren't allowed to track right now, at least in Iowa, between those. Um, any things that people have seen related to that? Well, I can just make a quick, I can make a quick comment. Let me turn this thing off somehow. Is that uh, the prescription monitoring programs are all run by the states, and so every state's a little bit different. Um, actually, a few years ago, actually, we weren't allowed to look at the state PMP program. Um, our VA counsel wouldn't allow us to actually look at it. They said we because we didn't have consent from the patients to do it. That was a regional decision, but that's been changed, so we can actually look at it now. But actually, I don't think there are any states that match with the VA healthcare system. That's one of the challenges we have. I talk about communication is that exchanging health information across systems is challenging, and it's even more challenging, I think, with VA because of our our hyper vigilance about um, protecting people's personal information. If you want to change that, you happen to be in Iowa. There's, there's a thing called voting and contacting your state representatives, congressmen, and senators. Because if you want it changed, it's up to you to change it. They're not going to change it on their own. It's up to us, veterans advocates. You're out here. You're looking at the changes in VA health care, so I consider you a veterans advocate, somebody that's concerned. If you're concerned with this, get a home to Congressman Loebsack. I've dealt with him for a number of years. He'll listen. All of our congressmen and senators will listen. If we can get the medical community and the veterans behind this, this is something we, as a group, can get accomplished. We can talk about it, but it's going to take action from every person in this room. If you think that is something we need to do, pick up that phone, call the congressman, call the senators, call your state representatives, call your local VA representative. Each county has one. Tell them what you think. They have meetings in, in Des Moines all the time. I attend a lot of those meetings. Uh, you have a veterans council for the state of Iowa. And you have a veteran service organization council that meets in Des Moines. Bring those things up to your different veterans organizations, your senators, and then we can push that through. You hear a lot of talking about funds. Well, that $17 billion fund is spread over a 10-year period. $7.9 billion a year. There was a, a, a senator that said, you know, we can spend the 
billions of dollars to send them a war, what's a few billion to help take care of them? And that's what we need to get across to, to government is take care of them. You're talking care of 1% of the veterans serving. I would think that 99% of us could take care of them. And that should be an objective. Get out, contact them. That's how we're going to get a lot of these things accomplished. Not by a panel again, but you people in the audience. Spoken like a good legislative liaison, that's right. <laughs> Any other questions for our panel? So I know they have some other events coming up. I believe there's a flag ceremony uh, shortly up at the Old Capitol, if anyone has interest in going up there. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel and for excellent discussion. And we want to make sure and thank all of our veterans both here and who are watching. Uh, thank you for all of your service, what you're doing on this Veterans Day and throughout the entire year. And uh, we will all be advocates for veterans health care in our own way throughout the year. And uh, thank you for your comments. On